You're listening to episode 23 of the On Being Human podcast. Welcome to the On Being Human podcast, where we believe transforming ourselves can positively transform society. Your host, Brandy Fleck, has the honor of exploring the human condition with real people who bravely share their personal stories of adversity, healing, joy, and more. If you're seeking empowerment, strength, and inspiration, listen in to engage and explore tough topics that help us humanize one another, understand ourselves better, spread love, and connect. Welcome back to another soul-exposing exploration of what it means to be human. Let's start with a few moments to reflect on the significance of the Notre Dame Cathedral that burned in Paris yesterday. My love truly goes out to those closely impacted. It was a humbling experience to step foot in Notre Dame back in 2007, such a magnificent creation and sacred space, and I can only imagine what the people of France are feeling right now. Former President Barack Obama posted this statement on Facebook yesterday afternoon. He said, Notre Dame is one of the world's greatest treasures, and we're thinking of the people of France in your time of grief. It's in our nature to mourn when we see history lost, but it's also in our nature to rebuild for tomorrow as strong as we can. I love that sentiment. History and its importance in our lives is something this week's guest experiences regularly. She's a master at connecting lessons through history to living a modern life that's more joyful. Stephanie Stewart Howard is a national author and journalist who's well-known in the food community. When it comes to history, she's loyally committed to and also well-known in the Society for Creative Anachronism, a historic reenactment organization known as the SCA. On nights and weekends, Stephanie can be found at various SCA events teaching the art of costuming or about natural fabric dyes, organizing lecture events at local university campuses that focus on history and textiles, writing articles for Wear Nashville magazine or Enchanted Living magazine. She has former articles for various Gannett publications such as Nashville Lifestyles, or she could be found writing one of several nonfiction books. You can find Stephanie's books on Amazon or your local Nashville Barnes & Noble, Parnassus Books, and the Omni Hotel Bookstore. And Stephanie's written titles such as The Nashville Chef's Table, First Edition, Barbecue Lovers, Memphis and Tennessee Styles, Restaurants, Markets, Recipes, and Traditions, Kentucky Bourbon and Tennessee Whiskey, and The New Nashville Chef's Table, Extraordinary Recipes from Music City, which is a second edition. During the day, you can find Stephanie writing software manuals and learning about technology. At home, she's an avid gardener and adores her husband and two cats, Kaz and Siggy. Stephanie has such a vibrant energy. She has her hands in so many creative pursuits. It's inspiring to see the progress and happiness these pursuits bring into Stephanie's life. A sure example that you can find community, really. You can find connection through history and hobbies, and it's okay to like the things you like. Today, Stephanie teaches us about connection and what she learned about connection and disconnection through travel, the arts, and food writing. This week's episode takes us into several weeks of exploring the impact that the arts, humanities, food, and education have on our human condition and how we interact with those things to shape our lives. What is our nature? I know it's our nature to create, to build, to live, Let's think about what we need to do on the inside so we can experience more joy and happiness while interacting with the arts, humanities, food, and education. Or even, what internal changes will lead to changing those systems that aren't working for us in these areas that are so valuable and necessary to our well-being as humans? As you think about these topics, tell me what you're thinking. Starting the conversation is a great first step to enacting change. Having hope that better is on the way is the foundation. At onbeinghumanpodcast.com, you can now sign up to join in this conversation with me. Leave your name and email address, and I'll include you in a monthly newsletter. No spam, I promise. Just updates on what's coming up with the podcast and the conversation that's happening with others in the On Being Human community. It's a chance to interact and have your voice heard here. I'm here to listen and find answers about why we are the way we are 
and what we can do to make things better. Not that we're not grateful for the good we already have, right? There's just always room for improvement. Speaking of gratitude, I want to thank you so much for listening. This new podcast is growing because you guys are listening and it's really exciting. So I want to ask you, are you loving what you're hearing at your favorite podcast on being human? And are you going to shop on Amazon this week? To support our efforts, you can now go to onbeinghumanpodcast.com front slash shop and click the Amazon banner there to do your regular shopping. At no additional charge to you, a portion of all your purchases made through that click will go directly to the production of this podcast. How easy is that? Same Amazon, same experience, same shopping you'd do anyways. Best of all, same prices, but you're supporting the On Being Human podcast. As always, subscribe on iTunes and Apple Podcasts, leave a rating, leave a review, and you can find the show's presence on Facebook and Pinterest for now. Without further ado, now let's hear from the brilliant and beautiful Stephanie Stewart Howard. Stephanie, welcome to the show today. I am so excited to have you here. How are you doing today? I'm doing great, aside from some allergies, so please uh, uh, accept my apologies in advance for any coughing that happens, um, but otherwise fantastic. Awesome. Absolutely. Yeah, it's a beautiful spring day, and I know the pollen is everywhere. It is. So, Stephanie, can we start off? I think you're such an interesting creative person, and you have your hands in so many different creative efforts. I would love for you to tell our listeners about yourself and who are you as a person. That's a big question. I think of myself as kind of an artist and maker. And that's kind of how I think of myself first in every way. And I've been that way since I was a child. I think my parents encouraged it. Um, One of the things that I love about my mom particularly is that the first thing that she ever read me was Shakespeare. She was an English teacher. So, you know, I would get baby food and Midsummer Night's Dream. That's awesome. And as soon as I was old enough, she encouraged me to tell stories. So I can remember being little, little, like two and three years old. And I would have my stuffed animals and stuff out. And she'd say, okay, tell me a story with your stuffed animals. And I'd do that. And that was the way she raised me. So there was never a point where being a storyteller wasn't part of it. And as soon as I was old enough to hold a pencil, I was drawing those stories and telling those stories that way and eventually writing those stories. My younger sister and I went through a period where we wrote a whole bunch of plays and tried to act them out with our friends and our relatives and anyone who would actually listen to us and and let us get away with that. And the older I got, the more I got sucked into things that would be considered like traditional craft, Mm -hmm. but I didn't think of them in that way. And um, a friend of mine and I have kind of a joke that we are the most traditional, non-traditional people that we know because (laughs) we're masters of things that are always considered like housewifely arts, things like sewing and cooking and gardening and all of those things. But while those are traditionally kind of lumped into the history of women's work. There are also things that are necessities that without them, you don't have life. Gotcha. So they may be women's work, but they're vital. Mm-hmm. And at the same time, it's kind of, well, but I'm also a feminist and my goal was never to be the housewife with six kids kind of thing. So mm-hmm. it's, it's an interesting merging of the things that women are expected to be. Gotcha. And the more I do those things, the more I understand the art behind them as well. And I've been a costumer probably starting from the age of 12 or 13, got really good at it in college, mastered it um, taking theater classes in college and grad school. And then afterwards, as a costumer for various reenactor groups, for theater groups, things like that, um, some cosplay stuff. So... There's almost no point where I'm not doing something with textile and fiber art at this stage. Mm -hmm. And I don't paint or draw much anymore. So um, that's probably like my primary art. But then I get distracted and go off and do other things. Like I'm teaching myself to knit right now. Awesome. And 
you know, I'll do embroidery every now and then just to keep my hand in. And I actually started sketching again this week because a friend of mine asked for a particular thing that she wanted that she couldn't find to do an embroidery project. So I said, sure, I'd draw it for her. And now I'm finding myself going, oh, man, I have let these skills atrophy. So I'm back at that again. Gotcha. But, yeah, if I think of me, I think artist and creator first. It's just not necessarily that being an artist, I'm going out and and painting in the fields like Monet or, you know, spending all my time sketching or spending all my time creating sculpture. Sure. But all of those are things that I've either done or I'm interested in doing. And every time I have a new opportunity to make something, I'm probably going to jump in, even if it's something that I'm never going to be really good at. Mm -hmm. Um, My husband is a master metal worker. I will never be good at that, ever. But every now and then, it's really fun to just try things like bronze casting, just to say you did it and you made this yourself. Sure. And there's something to be said for making something with your hands and sort of creating something out of thin air. I know it's just, what what kind of sensation do you get when you do those types of things? I don't know if sensation is even the right word, but there's a certain, like, pride that you take in, hey, I did this myself, I can do this myself. And I know there's kind of a revival of, you know, that whole pioneer woman idea, mm-hmm. you know, taken to extremes in some cases in our society. But the ability that you can do things for yourself, especially in an era where everything is really machine made, yeah, is incredibly cool. It is. It's sort of, you want to preserve those arts of hand making things too, because I think it's important to our humanity to be connected in that way to the earth and the materials that are provided for us that we start with, I guess. Yeah, I think that's exactly it. Um, I think you hit a nail on the head right there. Um, The other part of me is the scholar part of me. And I read a lot of archaeology and things like that and have worked with some archaeologists trying to do some projects that are based on on things that we don't know much about that have come out of the dirt and we're trying to figure out what they were like when they were new. And I am completely fascinated by the whole idea of making as a human thing. Um, And some of that is clothing and adornment. I mean, we have evidence from 40,000 years ago that both modern humans and Neanderthals were decorating their bodies with things, with beads, with colored strings, with all these things. We don't know what kind of clothing they had. I mean, they must have had something against the elements. Mm -hmm. But we know that from the beginning, they were adding these elements that made them special, that defined what they were. Mm -hmm. And I've kind of gotten off track a little bit, but the whole notion of making Because we live in an era that is defined by technology and most of our stuff is made by machines or even worse, it's made by machines in third world countries where we don't see the people who are sweating to make the things that that we want and need. And we have this whole concept of fast fashion that follows that, which is another kind of interest and passion of mine. But we'll buy the $5 t-shirt, right? Right. And we'll wear it 10 times and then we'll throw it away. And the thing about making something for yourself is not only are you putting in the extra time to make it special, but you're putting in the extra time to make it efficiently. And that thing that you made is going to last a lot longer than that $5 t-shirt that you bought at Target. Right. And in past times when people were less affluent and in other parts of the world where they are less affluent – You have to make something with the assumption that it's going to last for a very, very long time because you might not get another one. And so with archaeological finds, there are these things like combs. I mean, you know, a comb, we go to Target, we buy one, we use it for a while, it's plastic, eventually it breaks and we throw it away. And in their case, they're hand carving combs out of bone or horn or something like that or wood. And they are making them beautiful and ornamental because you might have one really good comb in your lifetime. And so it's something that you pack up and you take with you when you get married. And you're using that comb to the end of your life. And in some cultures, you're buried with that comb. And that comb is a specific and wonderful thing. And it takes the ordinary and it makes it extraordinary. And I think that's something that we've lost in life. Mm -hmm. And I think it speaks to 
like the trend toward the Marie Kondo, you know, does it spark joy thing that's going on right now? Sure, sure. Because we have a lot of stuff in our houses that do not spark any joy and in fact are just clutter. And I have some friends who are really good at decluttering and I'm not. And so I'm kind of trying to work toward that and was having a discussion with someone this morning about wiping out all the stuff that you buy, the crap at Walmart, Mm -hmm. and just erasing that from your life and only keeping the things that you value. And I think that's what that whole decluttering thing is about. Gotcha. Finding things that mean something to you and have value and to bring it back around. If you've done it yourself, it has a different value. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. There's an amazing book that's just called Craft, and I'm blanking on the author's name, so I'll have to send it to you, and you can add it to the notes. Sure. Um, He's an English scholar and archaeologist, and he's participated in some things like the uh, Edwardian House uh, TV show where everybody pretends they live in the past and they film it. And he was talking about his first experiences mowing a lawn with a scythe in the early chapters of the book. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like... Well, it's no big deal, but it's kind of a waste of time when you have a lawnmower. But he talks about the different ways you start to relate to the grass when you're cutting the grass with a scythe. Yeah. The different ways you start to notice your body's movement and your body changes and your brain changes and you get this sense of relaxation that you just don't get sitting on a lawnmower as you're cutting this, you know, two foot high grass down to tiny grass Mm -hmm. with this huge blade that you could also cut your leg off with if you're not careful. Yeah. So I think there's a lot to be said for just getting in touch with doing something other than sitting in a chair and staring at a screen. Yes. Very good point. And definitely we'll link to that in the notes. So you mentioned your life as a young child with your mom and how she encourage storytelling. Can you give us a little more detail about what your life was like growing up in general? I was a military and then a corporate America brat. So the biggest piece of my life growing up was constant change. We moved, if we were lucky, every three years, but more likely it was every one to two. So where most kids get to go to school in the same place, at least for a big chunk of their lives, I changed schools four, five times in elementary school. And I think the total by the time I got to college was nine different schools in seven different places all around the world. And when I was three, we moved to Greece and we were there for about three, three and a half years. My sister was born over there. She's four years younger than I am. Okay. That was an experience that I wouldn't trade for anything. I mean, you know, when you can say, Hey, 40 years later, I still remember all of this stuff. It's pretty amazing. Sure. It kind of transformed my view of everything, in part because when you're a little kid, you're a sponge for language. Mm -hmm. So as a small child, I not only spoke English, I spoke Greek and I spoke German because my friends also spoke other languages. Mm -hmm. And I think at some point or another, the crowd of kids that lived around me, we spoke different languages. So we ended up speaking some kind of mix of all of those languages. Interesting. And my parents tell me that they didn't really realize how multilingual I was until at some point or another, I was speaking to somebody in a shop and I was speaking fluent Greek and I was about four at this point. And my parents were like, we had no idea, (laughs) none whatsoever that you were that fluent. Yeah. Um, And it was just because you had to. But I also had the advantage of my parents were huge archaeology and history geeks So, you know, the first thing I saw in the morning when I was a little kid was the Acropolis because we were on the third floor of a typical European apartment building, which meant that we had the whole floor. Mm -hmm. And my window looked right across Glyphada into Athens to the top of the, the Acropolis. That's amazing. Yeah. I mean, nobody has that experience. And I was lucky enough, even as a child, to have it for several years. Mm hmm. So all the archaeology of that of those places, you know, walking at Olympos, walking at Delphi, um, walking on the Acropolis itself, that all stuck with me. Very cool. I was going to say, I imagine it influences who you are today to this day. Would you say that? Oh, absolutely. In part because we took Greek culture classes in school. I started elementary school there. 
And that's also an influence in that I started elementary school at four, where most most kids started at five. Mm -hmm. And today, I think most kids start at six. Okay. So I was always at least a year younger than everyone else in my school grade. Gotcha. And that was that was an adventure that was hard because I was also always the littlest kid, Mm -hmm. Um, which when you move around being the youngest and the littlest is kind of hard. Um, Sure, for sure. But anyway, um, when we came back to the U.S., I almost immediately stopped speaking other languages because people in other places thought it was funny. It was not cool. It was, what are you doing? That is so geeky. So, you know, you you train yourself out of that. Yeah. And if you don't use it, you definitely probably lose it a little bit if you're not able to speak it to people. Right. Right. And, you know, I can hear people speaking every now and then, like I'll be in a Greek restaurant and I'll hear them talking and I'll, I'll pick up and understand without really thinking about it, some of the words, but that's as close as I get. Gotcha. That and some cute little children's songs. (laughs) From there on, we didn't really live in Europe uh, any further until um, I was college and grad school age when my dad was running a company in London, but that was in the nineties and we moved across the U.S., so I had the huge advantage of seeing people in all regions of the country, and that also produced a very different worldview, I think. Anyway, you learn that people are basically all the same, but at the same time, they don't view themselves as all the same. Right. People identify with where they're from and take identity from where they're from. And I think when you're a military kid, that's impossible. Yeah. Um, I've read some studies that suggested that military kids have a really hard time adapting as adults Mm -hmm. and tend to move around a lot themselves, which I did in my early adulthood, but now I'm fairly settled, which is probably a good thing. But your worldview is always a little different because your concept of home is always a little different. Gotcha. Well, what is your concept of home? Um, home for me right now is, is where I am because my parents settled in the Nashville area when they came back from England in the nineties and after grad school and running around, um, being an actor and living in LA for a while and stuff like that, I settled here too. And, um, my sister ended up settling here. So this is as close to home as I've ever had. Okay. But my grandparents, both sets we're in different parts of Virginia. So there's still a, a part where Virginia is home. And I have a lot of family in South Carolina, which I never identified as home, but it was a place that felt, you know, kind of warm and cozy for me because there were a lot of people I valued there. Mm-hmm. Um, many of them, my older relatives have passed away. So it doesn't mean the same thing anymore that it did then. Gotcha. So home is sort of where the people you love are. Right. Gotcha. Well, this is a good segue into, can you tell us a little more about what your life is like now? Busy. (laughs) (laughs) For sure. I made a conscious decision, as you know, to move into the tech world Mm -hmm. as a profession a few years ago. And I think that was a really good decision. And I love what I do, um, being a technical writer with a software company. Mm -hmm. But I also keep a hand in, I spent a decade being a full-time journalist and editor, mostly with Gannett. Mm -hmm. Um, I published three, I just published my fourth book, which are all about food and travel. Oh, and they're so amazing, you guys. Those will definitely be in the show notes too. Thank you very much. Um, Sure. I had a lot of fun writing them. I was not trained as a journalist. My degrees are in English and theater. And when I moved back here from Los Angeles, it's 2004 and you know, I'm saying, hey, I'm not in my 20s anymore, and I'm not going to make a living in theater here. How do I, like, reinvent myself? Mm -hmm. And so the thing that I always knew that I could do was write. And so I honestly sent a letter to the editor of the living section of the Tennessean at the time and said, hey, just try me out and let me write a couple of things. And they did. That's awesome. And so I had a couple of years where I had like five jobs at the same time, Mm -hmm. which ranged from bartending to historic tours to cater waitering to all this other stuff 
while I was trying to be a journalist and then lucked into a full-time job with Gannett at Nashville Lifestyles. Um, and there's my cat in the background. His name is Kaz. <laughs> um, he's a very important part of my life, as is his sister. But uh, he comes in and talks every now and then. So, yay, audience, my very big fluffy cat. Yes. And he's the Norwegian forest cat, right? Well, he's part Norwegian forest cat. Okay. He's not a purebred, but he looks like he's a purebred. Gotcha. But we, because he and his sister were dumped together at a friend's farm in Kansas, as I segue over to that, we know that he's not a purebred. Gotcha. But he's huge and talky and chirps at birds and is pretty adorable. Yeah. So I started working with Nashville Lifestyles, and at that point, well, actually, at various points, we had five publications at any one time, and I was writing anywhere from a third to two-thirds of every magazine we put out and eventually became the managing editor there and was really the only full-time editorial person on the entire staff. Um, it was owned by Gannett and for a long time very independent of Gannett. Um, I got a chance to kind of explore lifestyle journalism as a thing. And it was both awesome and awe-inspiring, and it was also depressing in its way because at the point that I was really making my way into it was 2007, right before the financial crisis. So I was covering a lot of real estate, and you could see what was coming. Wow. You literally knew that this was not sustainable, and some of it was crazy, um, especially some of the massive building that was going on in downtown Nashville at the time. And I had the misfortune of watching in 2008 as so many of those projects got scuttled and people went bank bankrupt over them. And that was just depressing as all get out. I bet. Yeah. But the bright side was getting to cover some up and coming artisans and artists who have really been highly successful, ranging from very successful chefs to people like Emil Irwin, who makes uh, handbags here in Nashville, and other designers getting a chance to get involved a little bit in Nashville Fashion Week. I met the woman who eventually made my wedding dress, Olia Zavazina, who now has an incredible business um, in wedding and formal wear, who I'm so delighted. I still have that dress, and because it's a non-traditional color, I can wear it as, you know, a party dress. Mm -hmm. Um but it was also very fast paced. It was very draining. And there's a point where doing something that you love is wonderful, except that when you never, ever can let down from it, it becomes exhausting and you wonder why you love it. That's a good point. I, th I think that's true of a lot of artisans who say, I'm going to, I'm going to break out and make it in this business and make the thing that I love making my life's career. Um, I know it's, there's this whole follow your passion worldview, mm -hmm. but sometimes it's better if your passion is a side hustle. And it was hard for me to learn that lesson. Right. Like you can have a purpose and a path on this planet, but that doesn't mean it has to be your job and it can still be your path and you can take steps down it, I think. Yeah. Well, I mean, a lot of the great artists of history, that's exactly what their lives were. In theater, for example, a lot of the best theater that was made in the 18th and 19th century, some of those actors were not professional actors. Um, they were people who were actors after the fact. Mm hmm if you study um, Ibsen and Strindberg, the 19th century Scandinavian playwrights, a lot of the actors who performed for them were people who were ordinary people during the day and then actors at night. And they were great and they were talented, but they weren't Sarah Bernhardt. That's a really, really good point. I'm glad that you brought those examples up. And I do want to shift back to your books for a second, because I know you're doing these as sort of like a side hustle. Right. Yeah. So can you give us the titles of the books that you have out right now? And then sort of after that, tell us what does writing do for your soul? I should say that I left Gannett in 2013 to actually write these books or write the first one um, and kind of strike out on my own. And I was uh, a freelance writer for two and a half years. And during that time, I wrote the first Nashville Chef's Table. And then I wrote the Barbecue Lover's Guide to um, Memphis and Tennessee Barbecue. Mm -hmm. 
And then I wrote a book about traveling to distilleries and distillery history called uh, Kentucky Bourbon and Tennessee Whiskey. And most recently, just out, is the second edition of the Nashville Chef's Table, and it's a very ex expanded version. Uh, we've got 20-some new recipes and a bunch of new restaurants and tried to cover the changing zeitgeist of Nashville because Nashville food is a very different thing now than it was when I wrote uh, the first book almost five years ago. Yeah. So writing is something that, well, like I said, I've always been a storyteller. It's something I've always done. Mm -hmm. um, I don't just write journalistic style stuff. I personally write a lot of poetry and some fiction, which probably will never see the light of day. <laughs> as far as the fiction, we don't know yet. Um, I have whole worlds in my head that are mostly fantasy worlds. At some point, right after I got back from LA, I wrote about 300,000 words about uh, fairy culture in Nashville, underlying the service of, of Nashville pop culture. Mm -hmm. But that was a little personal, and one of the characters was loosely based on me, so no one else will ever see that. <laughs> and during that time was the time that I met and um, started dating my husband, who was living in Louisiana at the time, and he ended up as a very unexpected character kind of dropped into the story, even though I didn't realize at the time I was writing him. Mm -hmm. So in a way, I predicted my own marriage through my own really bad fiction that was written as kind of um, therapy. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny how people work their way into your stories. Isn't it? Yeah. But writing is just something that I almost do impulsively. Uh, I can sit down and write for hours and not even think about it. So... It's very easy for me now to do it because all of the journalistic writing that I'm doing, I'm doing out of personal choice. And there are only a few publications that I contribute to right now. Um, I'm doing a piece on ethnic food in Nashville right now for Where Nashville magazine. And that comes out uh, biannually and is uh, in all the hotel rooms in like the Hermitage Hotel and the Omni and the places downtown. Oh, yeah. So I usually do something every year for them. And I contribute to Enchanted Living ma Magazine, which uh, used to be called Fairy Magazine. And I'm super excited about getting to be part of that on occasion. Mm -hmm. um, I love what they do. They have just a, a beautiful worldview that I think right now in the current climate, we need more than ever. Mm -hmm. And it gives me a chance. Um, I recently did a piece on gardening for them, which is another kind of peripheral interest of mine that's gone over the top. And... Just the whole notion of living life, looking at the world from kind of a an artistic and magical perspective, which is something I think we need in life. I think we need to see something other than just the exhaustion of day to day. And if you can find the little ways to bring magic into your life, I think that's amazing. I really agree with that. And it's one of the reasons why I'm glad you're here, because I think you're a really great example of that, honestly. When you're talking about some of the nonfiction books you've written and some of the articles that you work on, a lot of it's about food and drink. And so can you tell us what is the importance of food and drink in your life and sort of to society or humanity in general? I almost want to start laughing because <laughs> all of that writing was completely accidental and I didn't know that I was going to really love it. Okay. That I write a lot about food is hilarious to me in part because I have... I'm a migraine sufferer and food triggers are a serious problem in my life and I have to actually be really careful about what I eat. But by necessity, I had to pick up food writing for Nashville Lifestyles and especially when I was traveling, doing travel articles, I needed to be really good at that. And then I made contact with a lot of chefs here in town. Um, I can drop some names like um, Tyler Brown and Tandy up at City House and Pat Martin and uh, Hal Holdenbosch, and so many others that regularly said, here, eat this, and didn't necessarily tell me what it was. Sure. And I had to make a pact with myself, kind of Jeffrey Steingarten-like. Um, he has a book called uh, The Man Who Ate Everything, and he's the food critic for Vogue, or was. And I had to decide for myself that no matter what it was, if somebody put it in front of me, I was going to eat it. And even if it was something I knew I was going to have a reaction to, I would eat at least a small amount of it so I could comment on it. 
Uh Um, which is really funny because at one point or another, I was at Kathleen Cotter's um, Southern Artisan Cheese Festival, and I was going from cheese vendor to cheese vendor saying, I need a piece about the size of my pinky fingernail. And they (laughs) thought I was crazy, and they were probably right. But um, dairy is one of the things that gives me severe migraines, so I had to have tiny amounts and just be able to tell people what it tasted like. Mm -hmm. And if Kathleen's listening, she's cackling. <laughs> anyway. So are you glad you did it? Are you glad you ate the cheese? Yes, it was delicious. <laughs> Good. Let me tell you, it was delicious. The experience of writing about food is a little bit different than almost anything else because food is like one of the great human pleasures from our earliest understanding of who we are as people. Mm-hmm. Like when you're a little kid, you know exactly what you want to eat and what you want to eat is probably not the liver and is probably definitely the apples and bananas, right? Yeah. Because the apples and bananas, those are delicious. So um, it's one of those things that's almost uh, makes you happy in your gut. And I mean that not just in terms of <laughs> your stomach's full, but it's it's a visceral feeling. Right. This is one of the great pleasures of life. And back to what I was talking about with Um, fashion and clothing, it's the same thing. You have to eat to stay alive, but you don't have to choose to eat things that are well-prepared or well-cooked or delicious, but somehow or another, as people, we chose consciously to make things as delicious as we could. And a lot of the writing that I do is focused on Southern foodways for obvious reasons, because I'm writing in Nashville. Mm -hmm. And lately, it's much more focused on ethnic food and the way that things like Indian food or Chinese food or Japanese food are are starting to move in and the the fusions that are happening between what's supposedly traditional Southern food and what's traditional Asian food and amazing things are going on. Mm -hmm. I was talking to Vivek Surti at Taylor Nashville, which is a new restaurant that at some point or another, we have to go out to. Sure. Yeah. He's very much the Southern fusion with Indian tradition kind of chef. And what he does is, I think, underline what the future of our foodways are. Mm -hmm. But just to go to step back for a moment, most of the food that is traditionally Southern food comes from roots that are traditionally European And almost all of that that we consider really fancy cuisine these days, you know, oh, let's have some cacova. That is the food of the poor. It is it is subsistence food that was cooked in such a way to make it delicious, to make it something that you wanted to eat, as well as making the best of what you had. Cacova, where you cook chicken in basically cheap wine all day Mm -hmm. until it falls off the bone and is incredible is really, you know, you've killed this old rooster. This is not great fresh meat, but, you know, you killed the old rooster because he was no use anymore. Mm -hmm. How do you cook this in such a way that it's not only nourishing, but it's delicious? That's awesome. Yeah. That's where so much of our food comes from. Um, So much of our tradition that we don't acknowledge is African-American food. And, you know, what makes stewed turnip grains so good? Well, you've thrown in a ham hock and you've thrown in some onion and you've thrown in some red pepper and you've let these things cook all day and suddenly they are the most amazing, flavorful thing that you want to, you know, take your bread and dip in the pot liquor kind of thing. Mm -hmm. All of these traditions come together to make what we're now calling new Southern cuisine. But it is the cuisine of farmers. It is the cuisine of minorities. It is the cuisine of immigrants that have brought what they had into a situation when you consider the Southern American past that is often poor, that is impacted by depressions, and that is impacted by scarcity. Sure. And when you have all of those things going on, how do you get something that satisfies your body and your soul and keeps you on your feet? And that's what our cooking is about. And that's a part of it that fascinates me is how we get from we must have nourishment to we can make something amazing. Yeah. Does that make sense? Oh, absolutely. So you have just touched on so many amazing things. And I think I'm hearing themes of even going back to 
when we started and you were telling your life story, sort of, we're talking about resourcefulness, we're talking about innovation, creativity, and it's all sort of connected from the food to reading and writing and creating things. These things seem to connect us as humans as well. And I think that you have an amazing gift for connection, connecting people, connecting with people, connecting history to our daily lives. Can you tell us what's behind that? That's a collection of life experience and pretty much everything I've ever done, whether it's being an actor, so you have to dig yourself into being another human being for a six-week rehearsal period and a 10- to 12-week run of a show, or being a scholar, um, or just a reader of literature. I mean, if you sit back and you read uh, classic literature, you read Dickens, you read Jane Austen, you kind of start understanding the the same things that troubled people in 1795 and 1845 are still troubling people and we're still trying to solve them today. Mm -hmm. Part of it is the historical reenactment portion of what I do because while that's a wonderful game, in that you get to play dress up and pretend that you're somebody who lived 500 or 1,000 years ago. It's also kind of an exploration of the similarities and differences between people then and people now. And again, it all comes back to we are all the same. And I think the biggest thing that impacts us is the desire to kind of make ourselves safe, but at the same time, make ourselves joyful. And so you find ways to take the safety component, the security component, and the joyful component and combine them together. Like what I was talking about earlier with, you know, somebody making a comb out of a piece of wood or a piece of bone and making that comb to last basically forever. We're kind of trying to do the same thing. We're bringing beauty and grace and joyfulness into the most basic needs of life. And I think that is the fundamental nature of what it is to be human, kind of, because animals do some of this. I mean, we see a little bit with like crows or raccoons or certain primates. They'll make their nests and they'll collect things that are very particular and they'll start using very basic tools to accomplish the process. And I think at the point that we became human, we moved from that point to how do we refine this? Now we have X amount of leisure time because we have our security. So how do we take that leisure time and enhance the secure place, the safe place, to make it also a place that we are content, Mm -hmm. a place that we enjoy being? And then how do we take the next step and make those things express our individuality? How do we make them beautiful? And that's the point where you go from we're living in a cave and it's warm and it has a fireplace to what happens when we paint the walls? What happens when we tell our stories by painting the walls? So we move from putting gorgeous handprints in ochre on the wall to taking that ochre and trying to sketch the bison that we're hunting or the horses that we're seeing. And what do we do with that when we move out of the cave and into structures? And so we have better light. And so we have a little more time to make the things that we want. And we suddenly discover we can make textile because we have light and we have access to the things that we can weave as opposed to just using animal skin. And there's this whole transition where we discover and discover and discover again. And one of the hazards of modern life is that because we're so connected to to technology, and don't get me wrong, I love technology. Mm -hmm. I have no desire to actually go back and live in a past where we don't have those things because technology saves lives. Uh And, and does keep us safe and does keep us healthy in ways that we have never had in the history of humanity. But at the same time, the technology encourages us, us to have a lot of stuff that is the same. So how do we take that sameness and make it our own? Right. And that's where being the artist and the craftsperson comes in. That's where self-expression comes in. 
And that's where I think if we're ever in danger of losing our humanity in terms of the way we use our brains, it's turning off those creative impulses because we think we don't need them because we're supplied with all the things that we need. That's a very interesting point. I'm thinking about all this and I'm trying to see how it connects to relationships because I know that you make building relationships look so easy. Like you guys, I see (laughs) Stephanie at work on a daily basis just is able to talk to people. Even when you're doing things in the SCA, people gravitate toward you. How do you go about making connections with other people? Honestly, that's still kind of a mystery to me because I see myself as being somewhat introverted, and this is true of my husband as well. We joke that we're introverts who play extroverts on television, (laughs) but I think part of that is the fact that moving around constantly as a kid, you've got to make new friends. I mean, you can't sit in the corner your whole life, and so there are the options you have are you go out and you reach out to people and you find the ones that gravitate to you and you gravitate toward and and you build relationships there knowing that in 24 months those relationships are going to go away and you're going to have to start all over again. The other part of that is the storytelling component as either an actor or a journalist or a scholar, which you know are all components of, of what's made me who I am. Mm-hmm. You have to look at the where's and why's and how's. And in order to do that, you can't divorce yourself from other people because you have to understand that people do things through impulse and you have to work with those impulses to understand them because people aren't cardboard cutouts and they have thoughts and feelings and hopes and dreams and Everybody has really crappy days, right, where you just, like, want to put your head down on the desk and say, I'm done for today, and you really can't. Mm -hmm. And everyone has insecurities and things that eat at them, and I certainly do. Um, But in order to function in the world, you've got to move past that. And I think people are, are ultimately social creatures, Very few people, even the most introverted, truly want to be alone all the time. The connections that we make with people are are crucial for a happy life. And for me, building connections with people as a journalist, you have to go out and you have to find the ways that you can relate to the person you're talking to and the person you talking you're talking to is not somebody that you would potentially really want to have as a friend really want to hang out with but you still have a duty to tell their story mm-hmm. because they're doing something that your audience wants to know about so you have to sit down with them and have a conversation and find a way in so that you can tell their story in an effective manner And probably that's been the most useful skill I have ever developed in terms of making connections with people. Um, As somebody who also struggles with anxiety, the other side of that coin is because you have anxiety, and I think to some extent the vast majority of the population has some level of anxiety, Mm -hmm. um, you have to be careful not to write your anxieties onto those people. That's true. Very true. Sometimes that's the hardest part of it all. So in terms of making connections, I have to make sure that I'm not writing my own anxieties onto other people. Um, My medieval reenactment group, I'm part of the Society for Creative Anachronism, and I have been since I was in seventh grade. So, you know, that's a a 30-year-plus commitment to an organization that I've participated in with groups around the world. Mm -hmm. And that actually was very helpful for me in terms of getting to know people and making connections that would help me the next time I moved in advance of those moves. Um, Certainly in high school, which was awkward enough when you move multiple times, Mm -hmm. if you've already got that kind of preliminary connection to people, Mm -hmm. it really helps. And when those people share at least peripherally an interest with you, that helps even more. Um, and the SCA is this this huge worldwide medieval reenactment organization. You can find out more about it if anyone's interested at sca.org and uh, find 
local groups and things like that if you have any interest. But it's something that started as a costume party bef- well before I was born in Berkeley, California. And they had so much fun, they did it again, and then they did it again. And before you knew it, it had created this vast, sprawling culture. And that was in the mid-1960s. And it was the parallel to the rise of Renaissance Fair culture and all of that. And where Renaissance Fairs are um, exterior, they invite people in to see a show. The SCA is interior. They invite people in, but only to play the game with them. Mm -hmm. And... It's a really extraordinary culture and like every other um, long lasting 50 plus year old thing in the United States is going through its own um, issues with the same things that are going on in modern culture right now. But it does give people who feel like they're looking for something a way to interact with others in ways that maybe make them feel safest. And I think almost every subculture that exists is exactly for that purpose. You feel like you're an outsider, but once you find your your correct subculture, whatever it is, you can feel like you're inside. And the people who are there, because they want the culture to continue, welcome you in. And some of those people will turn out to be your closest friends. But I think that's true of every community theater group out there, every church group out there, every scouting group out there, every hobby group out there, your local gardening club is like that. All of these organizations exist to make us make connections. And because I guess I've traveled so much, it's easier for me to make those connections because I'm used to doing it. It's the default in my brain. I've got to connect with these people because these are the next people who are going to define this phase of my life. But I think um, any hobby organization is designed primarily to do that, to make you feel like you've found, I kind of hate this word in contemporary culture, but you've found a tribe. Sure. You've found the people that are going to support you and be there for you. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And you mentioned the concept of feeling like an outsider. Really quickly, can you describe how disconnection feels? Have you felt it? I have definitely felt it. Um, again, with all the with all the moving, um, I think everybody feels it when they change jobs. I think everybody feels it when they move. I think everybody feels it when they are the new person standing on the edge of a group. And I think that our brains tell us that this is hard, that we might not be worthy of the people that we're looking in at, that we might not be able to do this, that we might not, that we probably can't. It's that insidious thing inside your head that tells you you're never going to get to the place that you need to be. And I think the notion of disconnection is really a notion of separation. It's, it's an us and them thing, which, again, that's a problem in our culture as a whole. We have got to get past, past us and them, mm-hmm. um, or we're never going to go any further. But as an individual, I think it's even harder, and you just have to find your way into those things. And that takes a lot of bravery, right? Sure. It's Because it's scary to be the new kid. It's scary to be on the edge of something new. And you have to take those steps in and you have to be aware that as you take those steps in, you're going to have failures. And I'm not great at failing. Um, I think that's something I learned primarily from my dad. My dad is really good at a lot of things, but I rarely see him take up things he thinks he might not succeed at. Mm -hmm. Fortunately for him, there are like three things in life ever that he's not succeeded at, (laughs) but At the same time, you know, hey, I'm not sure I'm going to master that, so I'm not sure I'm going to do that is definitely a thing. And I've seen myself be really reluctant to to take up something that I'd really like to try or something like that because I might not be good at it. Um, A shift to the tech world was definitely a huge eye-opener because I'd never had to have some of the awareness that I have to have now in working with subject matter experts and things like that. So... You have to be willing to teach yourself. You have to be willing to make mistakes. And in the end, you have to know you're going to make mistakes. 
And again, I'm someone who hates failure. I think most people hate failure. Mm -hmm. It's really, it's hard and it's awkward and it doesn't make your life happy. It leaves you with that knot in the pit of your stomach again. So I've kind of a little bit lost track of where I was going, but that's, that's my notion of disconnection, that feeling that you're not going to be able to go from step A to step B successfully. Sure. And that's with other humans, that's in a role, that's in a job, that's whatever else. Yeah. It's all really good information. And I'm just sort of trying to take it all in and process it for a minute because I know it's, it's all related to all the things we've been talking about. And it's important for people to, I think, know that it's okay to fail because that's how you learn. And that if they're in a state of disconnection, it's possible to get out of that state. And, but you, you brought up some really good points about, you know, bravery and finding the groups of people that support you and your interests and things like that. And you've done that with a lot of different groups. So you've talked about the SCA. You've risen in the ranks of this organization over your time there. Would you attribute the rising in the ranks to this royalty status that the group has? (laughs) Do you attribute that to your ability to connect or does it have more to do with the fact that you're an artisan, what do you think it is? I think it's both those things. I should put the caveat in there that I rose in the ranks really slowly for the group because I moved around so much. Again, I joined in the seventh grade and I moved around with my family and then moved for college and then moved for grad school and then moved to get on with my life. And that's, you know, more than a 20 year period there. Mm-hmm. And so I have been fortunate enough in the SCA, and for people who don't understand, um, the SCA is essentially pretending that we live before 1600 of the current era. And the idea is that you come into the group and you make up who you would have been if you'd lived in any place and time before 1600. Uh, with the caveat that you can't be someone who actually did exist. And you start out as, quote unquote, a nobody, although everyone is assumed to be of of gentle birth, Mm -hmm. and you work your way up the ladder. And there are awards that are given, and the group is so big, um, depending on estimates and the current membership, I think, Anywhere between 30 and 60,000 people worldwide are, are participating at any given time, and the numbers maybe actually be higher than that. That's amazing. And there are groups in Australia and Europe and the U.S. and Canada and, and uh, the Far East, and it keeps spreading, which is lovely because in geek culture, um, for something to last that long and be that successful is, is pretty astonishing, especially since there's a whole lot more available to people now than there was when the group began in the, in the mid-1960s. But um, ideally, it's a meritocracy. In practice, it's generally a meritocracy. Okay. Because there's always the, the impact of, of personal feedback. Um, for example, I have reached what's considered the pinnacle within the group as an artisan. I'm a member of what's called the Order of the Laurel. And that is for, um, in my case, uh, costuming and research and performing arts. My husband is also a member of the Order of the Laurel, but it is for um, iron smelting and bladesmithing and metalwork. Um, if you've seen Forged in Fire, my husband does that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Ideally, the members of the order in your kingdom, put that in quotes because the group is so big that it divides areas up by region and calls them kingdoms. And we choose royalty also in quotes every six months in a big tournament where people uh, wearing uh, recreations of medieval armor hit each other with rattan sticks and kind of beat the crap out of each other (laughs) although not really for the honor of that it's it's a martial art that's evolved with the group over the past 50 years sure and my husband is very very good at it and so we also he's multiple times been king of 
Tennessee, Alabama, Georgia, a little bit of Kentucky, uh, part of Florida uh, called the Kingdom of Meridies, and I've done that with him once, um, once we started dating. And so um, he is he is a duke, and because he is very good at fighting, he is a knight, and because he is very good at art, he is a laurel. And because I have been queen once, I am a countess, and because I am good at arty stuff, I'm a laurel. But it he rose in the ranks very fast. Okay. And I didn't, and he rose in the ranks very quickly because he was extremely good. He came in as a, a master martial artist in other martial arts, and so he excelled very quickly. And I moved around a lot, and eventually people all over the place started realizing, hey, she taught us to do this here, and she's taught us to do this here, and maybe she knows what she's doing, and hey, she's finally been here long enough. So um, it's, it's arbitrary, and elevation to anything, but royalty is not done because you fight it out with someone. It's done by long-term uh, setting examples, by making stuff that is extraordinary, by demonstrating your skills, by teaching those skills, and by sharing those skills. So that part of it is something that has been very crucial for me. The only ambition I ever had in the group from the age of 11 onwards was I'm going to be a Laurel. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, it took me 20 years to do it. (laughs) Sure. But that's not a bad thing. Yeah. And, you know, for some people it's going to take four or five and for some people it's going to take 20. And for my friend Carol, it probably took closer to 30. Um, But The thing about it is the ranks are nice and all of that, but what the group does and does very well is put you in touch with other people who do the things you like doing, whether it's costuming or metalwork or woodwork or leatherwork or or whatever craft is really cool to you or whether it's just research or whether it's, I really like putting events together, so I'm going to, I'm going to stage this whole event Whatever your skill set is, whatever your personal nerd out thing is, it puts you together with a bunch of those same like-minded people and you can feed each other's souls and feed each other's craft and feed each other's geek. And that is the most extraordinary thing. Um, One of my closest friends, Jennifer Matthews, who's the costume professor at the University of the South, and I have spent literally probably hundreds of hours working on projects together, in some cases putting together um, costumes for the coronation of a particular king and queen or for um, some kind of special occasion. And the bond that that creates is amazing when you've got a group of people working on something that's essentially a masterwork that's going to be seen by comparatively few people but will be an extraordinary piece of art. Mm -hmm. I mean, that just... That's the kind of thing that feeds my soul, and I think it feeds a lot of people's souls. Absolutely. Just being able to to make things that will have an impact even on a small number of people and to make those hand-in-hand hand with someone else. And so later today, I'm going to go over to my friend Laura's house, and we're just going to cut some stuff out and sew some costumes and probably drink a lot of Prosecco in the process <laughs> of cutting out and sewing costumes. It sounds amazing. Yeah, but that's, you know, one of the things that we do to bond. Mm -hmm. Making things is always a way to bond with people. Sure. And something interesting that you have made me think about is, as you were talking about the things that you do to rise in the ranks in the SCA, I think a lot of those lessons can be used just in everyday life. If you are approaching relationships and society to serve people, to help people find joy, to find your own joy, to relate, to offer skills and be of assistance. These are all things that we all need from one another. And if you do those things, we rise together, I think is the lesson there. And it's really cool that you're able to do those things in this, as you've mentioned, subculture. But I have, I have two more questions for you. Sure. And one is, can you tell us where folks can find your books? Uh, you can find them on Amazon.com. 
If you're in Nashville, you can also find them uh, at Parnassus Books, at Barnes & Noble, and at the gift shops at the Omni and several of the other hotels downtown. Most bookstores in town have them. Um, certainly, just about everybody right now has the second edition of Chef's Table, which is one of my favorite books, period. I love doing this book. So um, if you're going to start with anything, start with that. Also, it's full of really fun recipes, and I've made most of them. So I can tell you that um, they are delicious, in fact. They're from a variety of restaurants throughout town. Oh, yes. I agree, because there's this recipe in there for a chocolate Jack Daniels pecan pie. And it's oh, that's amazing. one of my favorites. It's amazing. I, I could eat that whole pie all by myself, uh, sadly enough. And then... Oh, do you have a website that people can find you at or a social media presence if people wanted to learn more about you? You can follow me on Instagram at StephanieGwen13, and that's probably the easiest way. You will get bombarded with pictures of my garden. Which is lovely. Gardening is a new geek of mine. Um, somewhere my dead grandmothers are sitting up on clouds going, who is this kid and why did we miss that she actually did some of the stuff we like? <laughs> I've I've gotten really into gardening the past two or three years and am trying to share that. And also you will be overwhelmed by pictures of my previously mentioned cats and possibly a little medieval stuff and definitely a lot of food. Gotcha. Well, and last but not least, Stephanie, what does being human mean to you? Oh, that's like a huge opening and ended question. <laughs> so being human means being able to determine who you are. Being human means you're doing things for more than just survival. It's that, that thing I talked about earlier where you have this amazing ability to take the most basic things that keep you alive and keep you functioning and make them distinctly yours, make them beautiful, and make them something that brings you joy or brings other people joy. That's the point where you stop just existing and you start loving your existence, if that makes any sense. Yeah, I love it. Stephanie, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Lots of good stuff for us to think about. And again, all of the links mentioned throughout the episode will be on the show notes. Thank you so much. This has been just a joy to do. And I've had so much fun. You guys, isn't Stephanie just so awesome? Plus, she has so many great books out. For all the cool stuff she mentions in the episode and all the links, go to www.onbeinghumanpodcast.com front slash episodes front slash zero two three. Be sure to leave us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts so others like yourselves can find the show. And I want to get to know you so bad. So let's have a chat over at facebook.com front slash on being human podcast. So there you have it. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Tune in weekly at on being human podcast.com for more soul exposing explorations of what it means to be human. Until next week, love to you all.